Everyone knows that Jewish people around the world use the Hebrew language for their religious practices, such as studying religious texts or reciting prayer. But there's actually so much more to Jewish language than Hebrew. In fact, there are numerous languages that Jews not only use in religious settings, but also use in daily communication, be it casual conversation, music, or even as a secret language. Welcome back, folks. I'm your host, Cameron Hila, and this is The Language Podcast. As I mentioned before, tons of Jewish languages exist around the world and are used in everyday settings. We're going to be looking at one of those languages today, Jewish Russian, which is also known as Odessa Russian, and dive into the history behind the population that uses it, how the language operates, and its importance today. Before we go any further, this episode is mostly going to focus on the Jewish Russian used in Eastern Europe rather than Israeli Russian, which is used by Jewish Russian migrants to Israel. Let's get into the historical background. In the 7th century, Jews from the Middle East and the Mediterranean began migrating to the Caucasus region, which is the land that would become the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. This area was claimed by the Khazars, a semi-nomadic group who converted to Judaism in the 8th century. Khazarians married migrant Jews and even came to adopt the religious practices of Jews, contributing to a religiously tolerant nation. The Khazar kingdom lasted until the 13th century, when they were defeated by the Mongols. Eventually, Poland and its German immigrants reconquered their land, once again establishing a place for Jews to live. Jews would move east to Ukraine for economic opportunities, where anti-Semitism unfortunately followed Jewish prosperity. Anti-Semitism rose to such heights that 20,000 Polish Jews were murdered in the Kmalniki Massacre of 1648 and 1649. Despite the genocide, migrations continued to Ukraine and Poland-Lithuania, especially when the area became a part of the Pale of Settlement, a region where Jews could legally live. By 1897, Jews in Ukraine, now belonging to the Russian Empire, near 2 million, making up almost 10% of the Ukrainian population. This number would drop significantly after the abolition of the Pale of Settlement in 1917, when more than 300,000 Jews moved to other parts of the Soviet Union. This was a result of World War I where Jews were blamed for Russian army defeats and thus were tried for espionage and treason and were expelled from certain areas. The use of Hebrew letters was outlawed soon after. Despite the restrictions on language, some Yiddish newspapers were established in Russia and used Cyrillic script to write in Yiddish. Alongside not being able to practice their faith, study Hebrew, or even leave the Soviet Union, Jewish oppression continued in the form of gulag imprisonment and intellectual suppression until Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. Jewish Russian was bred from the shift from Yiddish to Russian that has occurred since the 19th century and has been used since. Because Jewish Russian isn't an official language, it's not taught in schools and therefore is only passed on through conversation and heritage. Now that we've discussed the history of Russian Jewry from their origin to the fall of the Soviet Union, we can look to how Jewish Russian actually operates. The language, of course, is based on Russian language and is co-territorial with Standard Russian, which is the first or higher status language of Jewish Russian speakers. Before the development of Jewish Russian, Jews in the Russian Empire originally spoke Yiddish, a Germanic language with influences from Polish, Hebrew, and other languages. Generally, Jewish Russian is very similar to Standard Russian, but it is identifiable thanks to its influence from Yiddish. Even though Jewish Russian isn't labeled by the average person, Varying degrees of Jewish Russian can be used deliberately. When Yiddish loan words are drawn upon in conversation, they are used to express solidarity with others. When someone adapts Yiddish loan words into Russian for something such as a joke, it creates solidarity among Jewish Russians and marks their identities. Jews who are closer or friendlier are likely to use more loan words just to express informality. The Yiddish words used in Jewish Russian come from Eastern Yiddish, as do some phonological features. The biggest phonological feature of Jewish Russian is the uvular R sound, which is used in Yiddish and Russian words. A few other phonological differences may occur in speech for elderly Jewish Russian speakers, such as the lack of distinction between close-sounding Russian vowel sounds. When Jewish Russian speakers use Yiddish loan words, the stem or root of the word is borrowed, but any prefix or suffix on the word comes from the Russian language. When speakers of Jewish Russian write, they use the Cyrillic script common to Russian and other Slavic languages. 
Loanwords, if used in writing, also appear in Cyrillic. This is because of the aforementioned ban on the Hebrew alphabet that occurred in 1917. Aside from a speaker's personal preference on loanword usage, Jewish Russian and Standard Russian are very similar. However, I've picked a few examples of words from Jewish Russian speakers that come from Yiddish rather than Russian. The word for family in Jewish Russian is mishpashya. The equivalent word in Russian would be simya. Jewish Russians may also borrow the word goy, which is a Yiddish term for a non-Jew. Alternatively, standard Russian speakers may say nievri, which means Gentile, an older term for a non-Jew. Moving on to a more broad domain, sociolinguistic variation is essentially the differences between speakers of the language. This includes variation in regional and social dialects, such as differences in use between genders. As far as dialects go, Jewish Russian was more commonly used by lower, less educated classes at the beginning of the 20th century. This isn't surprising since upper classes, not just in Russian or Jewish Russian communities, but all groups of people generally have better access to education and thus properly learn a standardized language. Other than that, there are few concrete variations of Jewish Russian. Further variation is completely up to the user of the language. When looking at several writers from Odessa and their use of Jewish Russian, there are no consistently used features between authors. Even among an author's works, there are no consistent features and comparable writings. An important sociolinguistic feature of Jewish Russian is its link with comedy. Many comedians have come out of the city of Odessa, so many that a popular comedic style can be traced back there. The pessimistic style of Jewish comedians, such as Larry David, Mel Brooks, and Jerry Seinfeld can be traced back to Odessa. Their comedic style is probably derived from the Jewish comedians who emigrated from Odessa to New York in the late 19th century and early 20th century. With everything about how the language is used covered, I'll play an example of what Jewish Russian sounds like. For some context, the audio clip that I'm about to play is by a Jewish Russian singer-songwriter named Soy Korolenko, who performs in Russian and Yiddish, among other languages. The song is called Luli Luli and is a part of a genre Korolenko calls rap nagoon. Here it is. Еврейская вера, ди так и так и так, надо рано уставать. Эх, люли, люли, да люли, надо рано уставать. Эх, люли, люли, да люли, надо рано уставать. Надо рано уставать, мой да они засказать. Эх, люли. Of the three minutes and 46 seconds that the song lasts for, the first minute and 44 seconds is in Jewish Russian. This part, the Nagoon part, is about Jewish religious practices that draws from a traditional song from the Pale of Settlement. Some Hebrew features can be heard in the Jewish Russian segment, such as Nagel Vaser, which refers to the water used to cleanse oneself. Another notable Hebrew feature is Besa Midrash, which means house of study. With an idea of what Jewish Russian is and the history behind it, I'll go over its status in the modern day. Unfortunately, it's hard to estimate how many Jewish Russian speakers there are today, since the boundaries of the language are obscure and not well defined. However, it's known that speakers of language do exist in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Israel, and the United States. Just because the number of Jewish Russian speakers can't be documented doesn't mean it's a dying language, and in fact, it's the opposite. No shame accompanies Russian-speaking Jews when they use Jewish Russian in their conversations or entertainment literature. Whether it's for sharing a joke or using idiomatic expression, Jewish Russian is still alive. Through its rises and falls, encouragement and suppression, Jewish Russian is a language today tying Jews of Russian descent together. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Language Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Ela. It's been a pleasure. I will meet again next week.